It's funny how things change. Back in my day, parties involved an empty spinning bottle and seven minutes in heaven with the person you're crushing on. This generation opts instead for an embalmed hand and 90 seconds in purgatory with eerie spirits. But hey, to each their own. All right, let's do this! If you found yourself caught up in this trendy new hipster flatliners-esque party scene, do you think your party years are something you'd survive? Let's find out. Just know this though. I'm not here to teach you how to beat Talk To Me. I'm simply here to determine whether you would or wouldn't. What it boils down to is this. There are three types of films. Ones you can beat, ones you cannot, and ones that are dependent on who you are as a person. Talk To Me, directed by Danny and Michael Filippo, falls under the dependent on who you are category. Now what I've gone ahead and done is conjure together four Strange Thoughts magic cards tied to characters that linger near or directly on top of death. Each time a card is shown if your character type matches up with those who the card is meant for, you have to hold on to it. The back of one of these four cards is marked by blood, cursing you to guaranteed defeat. When all this is said and done, will you be holding on to the death card? Today on Strange Thoughts, you might survive. Talk to me. We kick things off at a party where Cole is desperately searching for his brother Ducket. Hey. When he finally figures out where he is, Cole kicks in the door to get to him, much to the chagrin of the host of the party. And from the looks of it, Duckett's had quite the rough night. That's okay though, this is what older brothers are for. Cole's gonna take him home, and Duckett's gonna never drink Everclear again. Cole takes a second before they leave to lecture the kitchen dwellers on their poor taste Snapchat story habits. Duckett's gotta feel so, so blessed to have a brother like- <laughs> God damn it, Duckett. He quickly retaliates against the blade that stabbed his brother by headbutting it. That'll teach it, dude. What in the fuck is going on? This is Mia, where to begin? She's kind of a good friend? I mean, good enough she'll scoop Jade's brother up for her when she's in the middle of a wild sexting session with Daniel. She even jams to music with him, which is honestly great for Riley, considering his only friend is a total toolbag bully that makes his money selling individual cigarettes to people. Yeah. Riley's in a jam, what should he do? Get out of there! You got it, let's see if Riley's that smart. No. Hell yeah, Riley. F smokers. She's also kind of a scum friend, but we'll get to that. Priority numero uno here is convincing Jade to go with her to what looks like some kind of seizure party. As weird as it sounds, seizures aren't really Jade's thing, but Mia pulls the It's My Mom's Untimely Death Anniversary card. It's my mom's remembrance day. So seizure party it is. Oh, remember Hansy Daniel Jade's slam piece? Mia won't shut the f up about wanting him to touch her chia pet. <laughs> Daniel's not touching your. Then you can come to yeah? If he's touching my- She'd tell you she's new boot goofing. But she does that thing where she'll do something quote unquote playful and funny, then post laughter, make a subtle, obvious, cringy, sad face. I guess they dated for like a week years ago. I don't know, high school bullshit. It quickly becomes apparent Mia is not very popular at all. People at this party are more put off by Jade bringing her than they are her bringing her little brother. Nobody hates Mia more than Haley, though, the keeper of what everyone's here for. Card number one, the ringleader card. Hold on to this card if you're the one amidst your circle that instigates the good times, which, when it comes to movies, doesn't end up good most times. For instance, in Flatliners, Nelson instigates good times by convincing his pals to participate in a daring exploration of what happens after death, unaware of the terrifying consequences that would follow. In The Descent, Juno instigates good times by leading her friends on an uncharted cave expedition, unknowingly setting the stage for a nightmarish fight for survival against predatory creatures lurking in the depths. In Midsommar, it's Pele who instigates good times by inviting his friends to attend a midsummer festival in his native Swedish village, oblivious to the horrifying rituals that occur there. In the case of Talk To Me, Haley assumes that role because she possesses the proverbial trending doorknob, the connector, the f***ing gross embalmed hand shielded by a ceramic shell exterior that taps into something it doesn't take a brain surgeon to conclude we probably shouldn't be messing with. 
She feeds off the power that comes with this ownership and carries herself as though no consequences would ever dare follow. Will this negligence of defeat ultimately lead to hers, and yours now too, now that you possess this card? We'll have to wait and see how things play out. While in most film cases, things do not end well for the ringleader character, even when they manage to stay alive, there are indeed exceptions. Whatever's going on, Mia volunteers to go first. Spoiler, it's not a seizure thing. First things first, your waist is strapped firmly to a chair. Oh, what, dude? It's gonna be tired. This is done to prevent you, or this, or it, from getting up out of said chair while things are underway. Next step involves lighting a candle, because of course it does. Basically, you're gonna conjure a spirit and let it take over your body for 90 seconds. So cool. If you don't blow this candle out within 90 seconds, the spirit you let inside can remain latched onto you. Capiche? If you die while it's latched onto you, it has you forever. To let it in, you have to hold the embalmed hand with yours and say, Talk to me. You'll then meet a spirit person thing you can let take over your body by saying, I let you in. Good spirit, bad spirit. Like Forrest Gump's mom once said, You never know what you're gonna get. Once inside and acclimated, it has the ability to converse with everyone. Word on the street is, when it comes to this thing telling you what to do, you should always do as you're told. Look and listen. Subscribe to Strange Thoughts and turn your host notifications on. Whoever's borrowing Mia's body lets Riley know the spirits dig his vibe and would relish the opportunity to split him. It then shows off just how powerful these things can be. Contrarily, Riley does not dig this scary ass whatever's vibe at all. I guess he's picky. Nearing the 90 second mark, Haley signals to nip this tomfoolery in the bud, only the spirit holds on tighter than Jack and Titanic. By the time they manage to remove Mia's hand from the embalmed one, 90 seconds have been come and gone. This is super serious. Let's try not to panic. The best one yet! Oh, right, they could give a shit at all. Mercy. Well, laugh it up all you want while holding on to card number two, the participation card. In order to determine whether or not you'd survive, participation is pretty much mandatory, so here you are. A lot of kids tend to throw caution to the wind when they're young. Take risks and do dumb as they'd put it, while they still can. Mistakes and irrational decisions made at 18 are lessons learned. When you're 30 and upwards, they aren't lessons. They're setbacks you can't afford to handle. Thing is though, being young doesn't make you impunitive, and death could give a shit about how much opportunity and exploration you feels owed to you to explore. Death waits for no one and gives zero favors or courtesy bones. All it takes is one moment, one decision, one dumb choice that could end everything in in the blink of an eye. The big question here is, could this be that for all of you? We'll find out. Believe it or not, post-party Riley's having trouble sleeping. As the man of the house, he checks to see if his sister is okay. Don't get it twisted though, he's not scared or nothing. I'm just bored. She tells him to piss off, so off he goes, continuing his man of the house duties, this time checking in on Mia. She's down for company, so he kindly obliges. When Riley asks her how it feels to have whatever it is that goes inside you when you let it in, she basically describes heroin. Felt amazing, incredible. I was glowing in the passage of sea. And then he asks her something specifically for us. You have to mumble. You know. Yeah, but the Strange Thoughts audience doesn't. It's called exposition, Mia. It was an accident. By mistake, she took too many sleeping pills. Mia's dad was asleep on the couch, and when he got up the next morning, it took everything he had to open the door, because he knew she was on the other side. There were scratches on the door, blood on her nails from trying to get help. She was just too weak, but she wanted to get help. Just death waits for no one, gives zero favors, and throws no bones. Card number three, the morning card. Hold on to this one if you've experienced losing somebody very close to you. The theme of loss and its subsequent vulnerability is a powerful and often used narrative device in film. While it can lead characters to a place of growth, it can also mislead them onto a path towards death. 
Is that unfortunate fate destined for Mia and yourself under these specific circumstances? Wait and see. The following day at school, despite finding the prior night's festivities ludicrous, Jade asks Haley if they can run it back at her place that night. Because Daniel wants to try it out, and what baby wants the baby gets. Say it. While inside, this particular spirit is very open when it comes to things Danny Boy would probably prefer keeping to himself. Like how dreadfully unattractive he finds Jade, and how alluring Mia's Chia pet sounds. Soak your Chia, spread the seeds, keep it watered, and watch it grow. Ch -ch -ch -chia. He gets a little too excited, but instead of turning to his girlfriend, it seems he would prefer her dog. Brutality. Once he's brought back, he storms off embarrassed. The dog is kicked out, and the party continues. For those ancient skies, I had these wandering eyes. But you took me by surprise when you let me inside of you. Inside of you. Inside of you. There's got to be some part of me inside of you. As the get-together starts to unwind, Riley pleads with Jade to let him let an entity take control of his body too, but for some reason, she says no. He gets combative about it, so she brings up how f***ing terrified he was last night. So much so, he wanted to sleep in her bed, and he was only begging to partake in things now to look cool in front of his cigarette-dealing sort of friend, and the older guys and gals in the room he wishes he was as brave and dope as. Final card. The Perception Card. Hold on to this card if you'd consider yourself to be pretty insecure about your value as a person. The type of insecurity that sees you often doing things solely to impress others in a manner that might bring more value to you in their eyes. I mean, take that 2005 Bruce Willis movie Hostage, for example. All Dennis cares about is looking cool to his not-cool friend Mars, leading to a royally f hostage situation that ultimately gets his brother and himself both killed. Sure, the underlining lesson is to never be friends with sinister looking dudes who go by planets, but underneath that lies the tragic reality of what can happen when you try too hard to seek someone else's validation. Will your fate be as cruel and twisted as Dennis's? We'll find out. Mia, in scum friend fashion, undermines Jade's demand that he not participate in the ritualistic fun. She justifies this by stipulating Riley can only let it take over for 50 seconds instead of the usual down to the wire 89. When Riley holds on to the embalmed hand, however, he seems to be less scared than he is concerned. He lets it in and it talks directly to Mia. From apologizing, to expressing never wanting to hurt her, and how much they miss her, we get the sense this could very well be an estranged uncle that died alone a total creep. Or her mom, I guess. Yeah, you know what? Let's just go with that one. The question is though, is it her mom or is it someone else manipulating her? See, when you let them in, you're not just letting them into your body for however long, you're letting them in on everything about you. And they're gonna process all of it and determine whether or not there's a way in which to exploit you into giving them more control. If the spirit that crosses over appears to be someone you loved very much and lost, 90 second closure simply will not cut it. Or in this case with Riley, a measly 50. Remember, they liked him. Liked him for the same reason they liked Duckett and presumably many others before them. They're weak, with very little, if any, self-confidence. And the weaker you are, the more power they're able to hold over you, the easier it becomes to bend you to their will. While Mia certainly isn't necessarily weak, she comes with the greatest weakness one can possess, sudden loss of her mother and best friend. They hold on for dear life, she goes 97 seconds, and they're able to latch on. From there, they don't act right away, they linger and absorb all they can about her while patiently waiting for the weak one to finally play. Once he utters those infamous four words, they manipulate Mia into not just forcing Riley past the 50 seconds they agreed upon, but way, way past the 90 second mark as well. This time though, they don't linger and absorb, they immediately try to force him into causing his own death, because if you die with it inside you, you are theirs forever. Riley kicks his own ass harder in this moment than Jim Carrey in Liar Liar. What the hell are you doing? Kicking my ass, divine! 
As Riley goes for the kill shot, Jade acts quick and shields the blow with her hand. They restrain him and call 911, but what they don't do is blow that yellow candle out. Mia stumbles out the room completely shell-shocked and sees what looks like her mom outside a back door. This is problematic. The cops try to figure out what happened, but our band of conjurers aren't talking. Anything they could want to know though is all over Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram. At home, all Mia's dad wants to talk about is what happened, but all I want to talk about is why this family keeps their home so dark at all times. Mia goes to her room and would you look at that, she brought the hand with her, and she gently caresses it like a proud lover might post rough s during aftercare cuddles. She tries to visit Riley at the hospital but neither Jade or her mom want her there at all. That's fine though, cause Mia's mom shows up at the hospital too, and it's pretty clear she does want Mia with her. Michael Sarah 2.0 neglects his girlfriend's side to check in on how Mia's doing, and she plays the I'm scared to sleep alone card, so he selflessly decides to go home with her. The two share a moment, you can practically see and hear the fireworks erupting above them, and well... Oh, what the <laughs> Mia? Okay, fine, this isn't the full context. Mia isn't just seeing her mom now, she's seeing other weirdos too. And this one seems to have a thing for feet. Oh, wow, okay, talk to me. I let you in, I let you in. She cries out to warn Daniel, only it's her who's lit crazy, not that other thing. He jumps to his feet and nopes himself the hell out of there. Startled, embarrassed, confused, Mia does what any sane, rational person would not do and once again talks to the hand. Finally, Mia comes face to face with her not mom, but she's too emotionally invested in the idea it's her mother to spot the similarities to the beat lady she lost her conjuring virginity to. Mia asks her if she unalived herself on purpose, to which her not mom basically says, No, f no, you kidding? I never wanted to leave you. Sidebar though, honey, Riley needs your help, McKay. And then they not mother daughter cuddle, which implies that candle stays lit all night. Negligent on two levels. One, imagine the latch control they have over Mia now. And two, you should never leave a candle lit while you sleep, especially on the floor. The band gets back together and Mia confesses she's Haley Joel osmenting dead people without the need to hold hands with the hand prompting the ringleader and sidekick to divulge the true origins of how they acquired it in the first place. Seems it was handed down by Duckett just prior to his blade mishap, and P.S. Duckett had been telling people he could see dead people without the hand's help too, and P.S.S. These spirit things can imitate whatever they want, and well shit guys. Things that could have been brought to my attention YESTERDAY! Mia's got it rough here, but so does Riley. Jade brings up every time he comes to, he tries to go permanently bye-bye. The gang realizes there's only one thing they can really do at this point. Turns out Duckett's brother Cole is still alive, so they pay him a visit. Cole resents each and every one of them though, says they were using his brother and that real friends would have seen the game they were playing was messing him up. Before they can tell Cole why they're there, he catches a bus, but they tag along. Cause boundaries I guess. Mia plays the I can relate card and Cole, despite not knowing her whatsoever, opens up. He says they get weaker the longer they remain inside whoever's playing host, and that after a while, they'll get flushed out. But pause, because I feel it incredibly necessary to point out Cole would not know this. I mean, how the f would he? Plot convenience is wild, man, I swear to god. Jade's heard enough and storms off the bus. Everybody follows and pretty much all the blame gets put on Mia. We interrupt this Strange Thoughts broadcast to better acquaint you with addiction, how it can affect you, and proper treatment solutions. Joining me as always is Richard of the Greater East Ridge Institute. Richard, how are you, man? Actually, Bill, that's Dr. Richard today, and I just so happen to specialize in addict recovery. Yes, I figured you'd be the perfect person to analyze Mia's turmoil here. Right you are, Bill. See, Mia... I mean, after all, you've had a ludicrous amount of struggles with addiction. I wouldn't use that adjective necessarily, and quite frankly, that's not something I care to talk about publicly, if you don't mind. Do you think, as somebody who lost not just his marriage, but everything good in their life due to crystal meth, makes you more capable of breaking down how Mia should course correct this crystal death conundrum she's facing? Stop at this instance, you no, hear me? No, yeah, for sure. Analyze away, Dr. Richard. I'll let it lie. It seems poor Mia, in her addiction, is finding any reason to seek answers in the hand. Even if those reasons are illogical, she can't see it that way. 
I see your niece and nephew once again drew your slides for you, eh? Yes. You, do you have a problem with that? Don't be silly. Of course not. How are the little Babadooks anyway? Agatha and Leviticus, if I remember correctly. Their names are Kimberly and Charlie, you jackass. Right. Easy mistake. Just continue. See, addiction is a complex illness, Bill, a habit that grows at a disastrous rate. You would know that, wouldn't you, Richard? Bill? Sorry, just a habit, my bad. At the bus stop, as all of the blame is being placed on Mia for what happened with Jade's brother, Mia suggests the candle might have never been blown out that night. And to fix what has transpired, they should have Riley conjure another spirit so that they can make sure with certainty they do in fact close the door this time. What a brilliant idea. Well, no, Bill, it's not brilliant. Riley's in a coma, so he'd have no ability to utter the phrase, talk to me or I let you in. But see, I think Mia knows this. I think she knows this and only recommends such a plan. So when they quote unquote realize Riley's inability to perform the ritual himself, she can volunteer to do it for him. Wow. Well, you'd be amazed the lengths those struggling with addiction will go to just to get their fix. Is it true what they say, Richard? Who and is what true, Bill? American rock group Third Eye Blind in their hit song, Semi-Charmed Life. That crystal meth will lift you up until you break. You know what? This conversation's over. Oh, come on. Don't be such a ninny. I've had it up to... You were so much more fun on methamphetamine. You know that? How dare you try and enable me? I am done with this conversation. Goodbye. Wait, Richard. One more thing. Christ, what now? In any case, by now it's safe to assume those holding on to the ringleader card and the participation card are safe from guaranteed death, leaving us with two highly potential candidates, the perception and mourning card. Both Mia and Riley have lingering spirits inside of them, and while Riley is more injury prone, Mia is far more conjure crazy as if talking to these pricks has to be the appropriate course of action. That being said, it's Riley they really desire, and Mia's constant stupid decision making only allows them to use her further in their effort to get what they want. As dumb as she's being, you have to understand that if an evil spirit took on the form of someone you lost and knew enough about your relationship to go as far as referring to you by a special nickname and taking on all of the mannerisms you'd expect and love, you too would no doubt fall prey to the same irrational thinking as Mia. We've learned plot convenience has allowed Mia, Jade, and Daniel 60 minutes alone with Riley until his mother is allowed to return. They get things set up, but like Dr. Richard said, the kid's in a coma, so how's he supposed to say, talk to me, or I let you in? Mia volunteers to do the ritual on behalf of Riley, which seems less productive than it does trying to make rules up on the fly. She tries specifically asking to talk with Riley, but a little girl answers the call instead, promising she can take Mia to him. And then the ultimate swerve occurs. I like you. Looks like Riley's in hell, but is he actually though? At this point, it's beyond obvious how meticulously manipulative these spirits are. And obvious too is the fact that they're trying to use Mia to hold on to him forever. That night when Mia returns home, a conversation with her father confirms the spirit she thinks is her mom is shocker, not at f***ing all. Because he confesses her mom's death was by choice, not accident. A total contradiction to what Mia was told by her phony mother one night prior. She's too far gone though and not having it. Back in her bedroom, her not mom Bloody Mary shows up in her mirror to let her know that the man she just spoke with is not her dad and that he's hell bent on causing her harm. She also slides in the fact that Mia's gotta kill Riley so that her not mom can protect him. The projection of a bizarro version of Mia's dad busts into the room and attacks her. Mia's real dad hurries in to see what's going on and amidst the confusion, Mia brutally stabs him in the neck. Seem familiar? Unlike Ducket though, these spirits have different plans for Mia than unaliving herself. They very carefully planted the seeds for Mia to conclude the poor kid won't stop suffering until he's put out of his misery. She hits Jade up and pleads with her to come over. She's losing it and needs help. Begrudgingly, Jade agrees to head that way. Mia's not home though. She's at the hospital, focused like a prophet on ending Riley and every last one of you holding onto the perception card. 
What she failed to anticipate, however, is running into Jade and Riley's mom. It's super awkward too, because she's no longer mad at Mia. Quite the opposite, she's pretty apologetic. Let's see how sorry you are in the next few minutes, sweetheart. Alone with Riley at last, Mia apologizes for what she's about to do, then discovers what she believes to be the spirit in control of him. Smart thinking on their part as this further cements into Mia what needs to happen. Back at Mia's home, Jade realizes she was duped and just how bad this situation is. Mia pulls the scissors out she used to stab her poor father and raises her hand to finish this, but at the very last second sees Riley looking up at her terrified. Talk about buzzkill. Plan B, something less messy. Jade phones her mom to warn her that Mia's gone crazy, but it's too late as Mia and Riley are already en route to a nearby highway incline. Someone tell Mia that plan B seems not only even messier than the scissors method, but also puts countless others at risk too. With her not mom's hands on her shoulders as she whispers how proud she is, it's as though Mia finally sees the reality here. She pushed going to the party. She got hooked on the ritual. She overrode Jade's insistence. Riley takes no part in things. She sucked Daniel's toes. She got tricked. And killing Riley would only make things worse, not better. What she probably gets wrong in this moment, however, is, well, ah, sacrificing herself for no reason. Looks like defeat for all of you holding onto the morning card. If it makes you feel any better, I'm right there with you inside of the loser circle. You should know though, this doesn't just mean we don't survive, it's actually far worse than that, I'm afraid. Because from this point on, all the way till forever, we're forced at whoever's whim to talk to any obnoxiously irrational punk ass that decides they'd like to hold hands. I'll let you in. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and sharing it wherever. Maybe leave a like and comment too while you're at it. Coming up next time on Strange Thoughts, arguably our most irrefutable you can't beat yet. It's gonna be a funny one you won't want to miss, I promise. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.